Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning for our 43rd anniversary. Uh, normally our 43rd anniversary, well, normally our anniversary events look a little different than this. We usually have a store full of all our reps and vendors and we've got classes and seminars and stuff going on all day. And things are looking a little different for us this year. Um, so it's a little bit different than we would have, but I think we're all still you know, hanging out and having fun and getting to talk about photography for a little bit. Um, we are here today to talk about filters for photography. Uh, if you aren't familiar with, actually, how many people are pretty familiar with Dan's or have taken a class here with me before or shop at a bunch of hands in the chat? Cool. Awesome. So, so good to see a bunch of people who are, uh, you know, coming out to join us. Ah, wonderful. Very cool. All right, so uh, how many people have never been to dance or saw this pop up online and thought, cool, I'm going to take this and uh, see what's going on? And we got some, some brand new people too. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Scott. I teach the classes and workshops and outings and stuff that we do here at Dance Camera City. Uh, this is our 43rd year. Uh, we started in 1977, and uh, we are still a small, local, family-owned camera store, but also the largest single-location camera store in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've got a full lab where we produce all kinds of great prints and canvases and metal prints and gifts and cards and all that kind of stuff. Um, we've got a fantastic frame shop with some people who do some creative and wonderful work, and mostly we've got a great group of people who work here, uh, the kind of people that make it fun to come to work every day and who are all passionate about photography and all always here to help you out and answer your questions. So like I said, things look maybe slightly different this year, but we're kind of rolling with it and doing what we can to make that work for everybody. Um, we're rolling out some new stuff this week that I wanted to talk about. We are doing pre-scheduled visits. If you want to make sure you can get in here and get some personal attention and get your questions answered, but you don't want to hang around waiting around for somebody, you can schedule an appointment ahead of time. So you can make sure that when you get here, you're going to have somebody to talk to and you've got some, some time set aside just for you. Uh, same thing applies for our custom frame shop. If you have work that you need framed, you can make an appointment ahead of time to make sure you get that taken care of. And we're also doing some stuff with online visits where if or maybe you're just out of the area if you're coming from a little farther away or you're not in the immediate vicinity you can talk to one of our staff just like you were here in the building you can get online with them and have a one-on-one -on -one face to face chat with them where they can help you figure out a button on a camera or show you some different features of things that you might be looking at so you're looking for a gift idea for the photographer on your list and they'll be able to help you out right there online and you don't even have to change out of your pajamas. Um, and curbside delivery is coming back. So curbside pickup, you can place an order online, stop by, pick it up, we'll bring it right out to your car. And we know that people are running into problems with shipping. We're seeing all kinds of shipping delays this year, no matter what carrier you're using. So we're, we've decided to do it ourselves. If you're in Lehigh or Northampton County, for $5, we will drive your package out to you to make sure you get it in time for the holidays, all right? So we've got all these new things that we're doing. We've got all kinds of other stuff going on for the 43rd anniversary. We've got webinars coming up for the rest of the day. We've got a bunch of other stuff. We've got sales going on. And before we get started, I want to cover a little bit of technical stuff here. I want you, if you haven't used Zoom before, take a look at the little buttons at the bottom of your Zoom window. There's a button down there that says chat. Pop that open so we can kind of run questions. But actually the more important one is the Q&A panel. The one that says Q&A and there's two little like cartoon speech bubbles. Open that one up because we're gonna leave some time at the end for questions and answers. And we can make sure that uh, if something comes up, if you wanna go back and talk about something in a little more detail, throw a question in the Q&A. And then when we come around to those at the end, I'll make sure we go through all those questions and get your questions answered. All right. So we've got Mike from ProMaster here today to tell us a little bit about filters for photography. Uh, I just picked up 
a new ProMaster variable neutral density filter a couple months ago that I absolutely love. Um, they've got some fantastic stuff. So I'm going to turn it over to him. Thanks, Mike, for joining us this morning. Hey, good morning, Scott. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone out there in uh, the wonderful land of the internet. Uh, as Scott said, I'm Mike Northrup. I'm the Vice President of Sales at uh, ProMaster. I've been a photographer uh, my entire adult life now, actually my entire life. Uh, I got my first camera when I was uh, four years old and uh, it has been an obsession of mine ever since. I've uh, been fortunate to have worked in the photo industry uh, for 17 years now, uh, both as a photographer, um, as a retailer. I used to run camera stores in my home state of Florida. And then uh, for the last uh, about six and a half years now, I've worked on the distribution and brand side, uh, working with retailers like Dan's Camera City on their inventory and helping them find great products for their consumers. So with that in mind, I want to jump into my presentation today and, uh, you know, we're going to walk through how and when you would use uh, some different types of filters uh, for your photography. Uh, I don't sell anything that I don't personally use. You know, I'm a, a passionate, active photographer myself. So everything we're going to talk about today, including the majority of the example photos I show you, um, are... Uh, are things that I've actually used and have actually shot and believe in very much. So uh, while I am a professional salesman, I'm a photographer first. So this is just one photographer talking to a, a group of others today. So uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, as I said, I um, got my first camera when I was four years old, got my first SLR when I was 16 and started shooting live band photography um, as, uh, as a bit of a hobby. And then that um, somehow invariably segued into uh, becoming a, a, a wedding and portrait photographer. Um, used to shoot uh, about 10 to 12 weddings a year. Uh, used to shoot uh, uh, just dozens of family portraits and senior portraits and business headshots uh, a year. And uh, uh, then eventually that uh, parlayed into a completely different type of work for me. Uh, which was commercial photography. I've uh, uh, done a whole lot of, uh, of jewelry. I've, I've done some wire and insulation, which is complete opposite end of the spectrum. But one of the greatest compliments I ever got from that client was, hey man, you make wire look sexy. I didn't know how to take that other than uh, thanks. But <laughs> uh, so that's, that's a little bit about my background. Um, the things that I'm passionate about photographing um, now that I'm no longer getting paid to photograph, um, is I'm a nature and wildlife uh, with a focus on macro. Uh, these are some macro photos uh, uh, that, that I've taken over the, over the course of my time. Uh, another nature photo that I've uh, taken. I love architectural uh, photography, both uh, new and unique stuff uh, like this one. This is at the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, um, as well as uh, what I would call aged architecture, uh, like uh, this photo here. This was taken at a church that, uh, no kidding, got knocked down by a, uh, a snowstorm about two months after I captured this photo. So if you get nothing out of today's presentation, the moral of the story is photograph it when you can because you don't know if it's going to be there tomorrow. Uh, uh, a friend found uh, this church for me. It was off the beaten path on, off a country road um, in uh, rural Ohio, and we went and shot it together. And this was uh, a picture I got of the front door. It was built in the 1830s and was uh, effectively abandoned sometime in the uh, 1930s or 40s, as memory serves. And as far as I could tell, it was only still there because of the historic cemetery that was behind it. So I'm glad I photographed it uh, while it was still standing. Nowadays, a lot of my photography is uh, built around uh, uh, my kids, and I photograph them as much as I can and probably more than they want. This is my 12-year-old Candace, uh, my 2-year-old Liam, and my soon-to-be 11-month-old uh, uh, Chloe. And I also love to uh, photograph my bride of nearly five years. That's when she'll let me, that is. <laughs> So let's get started. What are the types of filters that are in my camera bag that might benefit uh, you 
and help you along your photographic journey. Well, the first one we want to start with is, what, is what's called a UV filter, or sometimes you'll see these as protection filters. They are actually two different filters. A UV filter, as the name might suggest, uh, does filter uh, UV light, and a protection filter does just that. It protects. It's your first line of defense against scratches, dust, dings, water, uh, bumps if you're a concert photographer like I used to be, uh, sticky kid fingers if you've got a toddler and a newborn like I do. Um, so I always recommend that every photographer have a either a, or a protection filter on the front of every single lens that they use, uh, period. You put it on, you leave it on, and you never take it off. That is your first line of defense because it's far easier to replace a $20, $40, $100 filter than it is to replace a $500, $800, $1,000 lens. And uh, if that front element gets busted, mm, that's no fun. Um, I remember a time when I was running a camera store in, in the state of Florida where a customer bought a Tamron 18 to 270 from me. She purchased a ProMaster filter on it. Uh, the very next day, she was out photographing her daughter's softball game, and a stray softball came and hit her square in the lens. Um, the lens was fine. It ruined the filter. Uh, but had she not had that filter, uh, that would have ruined the lens that at the time, uh, I, I think this was version one of the 18 to 270. So as memory serves, it was selling for around $600. So that would have been a very expensive accident after only two days or effect, effectively a day and a half of owning the lens. Now, not all UV filters are uh, created equal. Um, and not all protection filters are created equal. Let's first discuss the topic of which do you need? Do you need a UV filter or do you need a protection filter? Well, I would say for most photographers that a protection filter is adequate if you're using a digital camera. And the reason for that is, is that your camera's internal sensor, um, the, the sensor that actually captures the image, has some built-in uh, filtration. It can usually filter somewhere around, uh, I believe the number is 370 meters of, uh, of UV light. Most UV filters on the market only filter 350 nanometers of UV light. So um, your a, a UV filter on top of the filtration that you're already getting from your camera really isn't going to do a whole lot unless you live in an area um, that is close to the equator um, or high elevation or has a very high uh, UV index. So you can read that as live in the mountains, live, live at the beach, live in Florida, <laughs> you know, the, the, those instances where that UV index is high, you're gonna be more susceptible to um, a phenomenon that's called UV haze, where your photo can actually look, as the name suggests, hazy and kind of murky and cloudy because of all that UV light that is uh, coming and hitting your sensor. Um, for film photographers, if I have any film photographers on the on uh, um, in, in last today, if you're still shooting film, a UV filter is a necessity for you because your your camera does not offer that native UV uh, filtration. But again, for most photographers, maybe not a need for you. Um, I live in Connecticut now, where our, our home office is. I lived in Ohio for three and a half years, but prior to that, I was born and raised in Florida and. and um, uh, my entire life there. That's why uh, so many photos that you're going to see today were photographed um, in Florida. Because I come from Florida, I still put a UV filter on the front of every lens I own because I do benefit from that UV filtration. Now, somebody's going to say, now, wait a minute, Mike, didn't you just say that most UV filters can't filter more than um, the built-in uh, filtration in your camera? Yes, I said most. Most filter at about 350, whereas most cameras filter around the 370. ProMaster HGX Prime filters are the only filter on the market at present that filter up to 410 nanometers of light. So they actually can filter more UV light than um, your camera's built-in sensor uh, and, and built-in UV filtration can. 
So because during non-COVID times, I still travel to Florida a lot, still do a lot of photography down there. Um, and because I've been ingrained to use a UV filter, um, I, uh, I choose to put a UV filter on the front of every lens that I own. And because it can filter above and beyond what my Olympus camera's built-in sensor can, I get that added benefit and I'm not gonna have any UV haze introduced into my photography. Now, you'll notice that a UV or protection filter, these are the only filters that we're gonna talk about today that I don't have example photos for you for because I have never taken a photo without one of these filters on the front of my lens. You put it on, you leave it on, you never take it off because it's your first line of defense. Now, not all filters are created equal. Um, setting aside other brands uh, for a moment, let's just talk about the three differences between ProMaster's three grades of filters, um, all three of which I believe uh, Dan's carries. The collection that we're gonna be talking about the most today that all of these example photos um, uh, were taken with uh, was um, the HDX Prime uh, filter. So these are our highest quality filters. Uh, we use the best optical glass available. And because uh, not all photographic needs are, are identical, um, and uh, because, uh, whoops, sorry, just lost my, uh, my presentation there. Give me just a moment. Uh, because not all uh, photographic needs are identical, we don't use the same type of glass in all of our HGX Prime filters. We use the right glass for the job. Um, they have our exclusive Repelamax technology on it. That's an anti-static barrier that resists uh, fingerprints and, and smudges. If you get water on it, it'll bead right off and it makes it ridiculously easy to clean. We have up to, up to 36 layers of um, anti-reflective coatings. So those anti-reflective coatings are important and it's important to find a filter that matches the quality of your lens because the more reflections you have coming into that lens, whether it's through the filter or the elements within the lens, the more light is bouncing around and the lower your sharpness is gonna be. So you won't experience any degradation in sharpness with any lens uh, when you use an HGX Prime UV or protection filter because it has such a high number of those um, high quality advanced um, anti-reflective coatings. Uh, and they're also uh, scratch resistant. Uh, our digital HD filters use a special type of optical glass called uh, Schott optical glass. That's a, a German brand of optical glass. Um, we use 12 layers of, of anti-reflective uh, coating. It doesn't have the Repelamax. Um, and then our standard filters are just, you know, single coated or multi coated. They get the job done, but there's uh, nothing spectacular about them. Uh, as I said, not all brands or all types of filters are created equal. Uh, when you're comparing other brands of filters out there that maybe you already own or you've shopped at, um, you shopped at a store other than, than Dan's that carries a different brand of filters, you do, do need to know that the quality of glass that you choose is very important and the number of, uh, of uh, uh, excuse me, coatings that you use is very important. A lot of filters out there that sell for similar prices as mine aren't actually glass, they're resin. Resin is a fancy word for overpriced plastic. So you wanna watch out for that. And if they're not disclosing the exact number of coating um, on the picture on their online literature, chances are it's not a multi-coated filter. So you run the chance of having some image degradation quality. So uh, let's take a look at what our next filter type is. And this is a circular polarizer filter. A circular polarizer filter is essentially sunglasses for your camera. And, um, you know, I like to tell stories when I'm teaching photography because uh, as photographers, we're all visual creatures. So I think we can understand a, a, a story and example photos uh, better sometimes than we can the tech specs that go behind the product. So here's my story with circular polarizers. I was a reluctant user of circular polarizers for many, many years. And when I say reluctant user, what I really mean was I, when I got my, my first job at a camera store, I was working at Ritz Camera uh, when I was in high school and I used my whopping 10% discount to buy one of their cheap store brand uh, circular polarizer filters. 
and I would go outside and put it on and I would just get disappointed with the results. It made my images look kind of a brownish tone and kind of murky and just yuck. That's the best. film uh, can't see that light and color the same way that you can. So what a circular polarizer does is it increases that saturation, it increases that contrast, and adds that pop back to your photos. Let's take a look at some examples and you'll see what I mean. So this is a uh, awesome rusted out rail car that I found off the beaten path in Sarasota, Florida, which is just south of my hometown of Bradenton. Um, I set up on a tripod and I took a picture with just my UV filter on, no polarizer. And I was a little underwhelmed by the results, to be frank, because my blue sky wasn't as punchy as what I was seeing. Um, the, the, the green of that overgrowth and the, the orange and yellow tones of um, the, the, the dried out grass and, and overgrowth, I, I wasn't quite getting that. And I wasn't getting this, the same deep, rich um, oranges and reds and, and deep reds out of this rusted out rail car that I was seeing with my eyes. So teachable moment. I put on a polarizer and I took the photo again and here's the result that I got. Much, much deeper, whoops, much, much deeper blues. Uh, I've, I've got a lot more contrast and detail back um, in all my overgrowth here and the color that I'm getting out of the rail car is much truer to life. And you'll notice that um, some of the graffiti here that, that has been washed away over time, it looks very light and pretty insignificant um, in the photo without a polarizer. But here it's much more vibrant and saturated and it, it just helps tell the story better. So uh, this is Lake Wales, Florida, a wonderful place called Bach Tower Gardens, one of my favorite botanical gardens on God's green earth. I mean, it's just awesome and it's huge. Uh, you could spend a couple of days there and I don't think you'd be able to photograph everything. So I was out testing a Tamron 10 to 24 lens that day, which is an ultra wide angle lens for APS-C um, uh, sensor cameras. And I stumbled across this um, pond that had these lily pads that were, you know, couple feet around. I kept waiting for Kermit the Frog to jump out with his banjo. Uh, and I just knew that I had to photograph this. So I set it up on a tripod, I put, uh, put the lens on, and I intentionally, knowing that one day I'd be teaching about polarizers, I took the photo without a polarizer. And I was disappointed, much like I expected. Um, the, the, the blues in my sky weren't as, as, uh, as, as rich. I wasn't getting the contrast between the clouds. Um, I uh, wasn't getting the level of, of detail and depth in the green uh, that I wanted. It was just an overall disappointing photo. So I liked my composition. I liked all my other settings. I was shooting at f22 because I, I wanted everything from, you know, the, the, the front of this rock face all the way out to the far of this uh, palm tree just to be tack sharp. So I added a circular polarizer. And the beauty about a circular polarizer is you can turn it and adjust it to get the level of polarization you want. So I adjusted it until I saw the level of contrast and depth that I was looking for. And then I took the photo and now we're getting much more what I like. My blue sky's back, the, the richness in my greens are back. Um, those lily pads are nice and vibrant. Um, and then I'm getting some beautiful reflections in the water too. So that, that was more in line with what I was looking for.
a hidden tool that you can use polarizers for is you can also use it to remove reflections in glass. So unfortunately, I don't have any example photos to, uh, uh, to show you today. Um, uh, but uh, one of my favorite things to do when I take my kids to an aquarium is to photograph all the fish. But you're probably thinking, gee, that sounds like a pain in the rear because you've got all that ambient light that's reflecting. You've got the kid who's picking his nose. You know, you've got, got his, his uh, uh, re reflection in the glass. Well, easy solution is you put on your circular polarizer, you adjust it until you see all those reflections go away and you take the shot and it's like you're in the water with the fish. So it's a, a circular polarizer is a wonderful tool whenever you need to remove reflections. Um, if you're trying to you know, get light out of a photo, um, we used to use it in, uh, in one of the photo labs that I ran when we were photographing um, antique photos that we couldn't remove from the frame because they were stuck to the glass. What we would actually do is shoot up over the um, uh, up over the, the framed print and use a polarizer to uh, remove all the light and, ref and reflections, both the reflection of myself in the photo as well as the reflections of, of, of the light that we were using um, uh, to shoot the print and then use that digital file to make a, 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 a duplicate of the photo for the customer. So there's a lot of uses for a circular polarizer um, beyond uh, what it's natively designed to do, which is to um, increase your saturation and contrast. So let's move on to our next type of photo here. So uh, here we have neutral density filters. Neutral density filters are used by both photographers and videographers to control the amount of light that is coming into your camera. Um, now there are uh, uh, neutral density filters measure how much light they are reducing in stops. So just like you have um, you know, f-stops on your camera, you're reducing certain amounts of, uh, of stops of light by using an ND filter. Um, and there's two instances where you'd use that. For the videographer, a videographer often uses it when they want, um, let's say they're shooting on a bright sunny day. Videographers don't have as much control over their shutter speed as photographers do. Um, so they might use a neutral density filter to reduce some of the light coming into the frame. Let's say that I'm doing an interview with somebody in a busy shopping mall. Hey, remember those? We used to go to those. Um, and I want to eliminate some of um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the background uh, uh, movement so I'm not distracting from my subject. Well, typically the way I would do that would be to shoot at a um, a, a more wide open f-stop, so a lower number, like, a, uh, like an f4 or 2.8. But if you're in a really bright environment, you can't necessarily uh, uh, do that, particularly since you don't have as much control over your shutter speed when you're a videographer. So the solution is you put a variable neutral density filter in, that, that's going to reduce some of that light. Now I can open uh, the iris of, uh, of my aperture wider and I can get that shallow depth of field uh, that I'm looking for and focus just on the subject that I'm interviewing instead of all the extraneous detail behind them. Photographers use a neutral density filter usually to slow down time. So uh, we use it to control shutter speed, whereas videographers will use it to control aperture. Um, now, why would I want to do that? mostly to create the sense of movement. And I'll give you a couple of, it, of examples of that um, in just a moment. So there's uh, two types of neutral density filters. You have what are called fixed neutral density filters. So these are a single filter um, that uh, filter out at a specific amount of light. So in the instance of the one that's on the left here, this is an HGX Prime IRND uh, 1000. That is a, um, that is a 10 stop neutral density filter. This is a, whoops, this is a drop in filter. It, it does the exact same thing, only we use a drop in holder rather than screwing it in, which makes it a little bit quicker and easier to recompose your shot and focus because you're it's kind of like you're putting welding goggles on. It's very hard for your camera to, to see through that much uh, uh, light when you're trying to, um, uh, when you're trying to get your uh, initial focus. So a lot of uh, 
serious outdoor photographers photographers will use an, a, a drop in filter like this they'll compose the shot they will um they'll focus and then they'll put the drop in filter in and adjust their exposure and take the photo the other common type of filter and this is the one that scott was referring to that he picked up a couple of months ago is a variable nutrient density filter in each of these three uh, photos that you see on the screen at the moment this is actually the same filter just at different stops so a variable nd much like a circular polarizer adjusts by moving the front element of the filter and as you do so you were moving from a little bit of, of uh, light reduction to a whole lot of light reduction right there within the same filter. Now, there's a couple of inherent um, drawbacks of using a fixed neutral density filter. Number one is, um, or excuse me, a, a not, a, not a fixed ND, a, a variable ND, excuse me. Uh, one of the drawbacks of using a variable ND filter is there is a little bit of loss of, of sharpness. Effectively, you're using two polarized pieces of glass and moving them in opposite directions. So that causes more light to bounce around in there. So that can reduce some of your sharpness and clarity of your photos. Um, some ND filters, depending on the grade or quality of the, the density coatings, um, can actually cause some funky color casts. So that's just something you need to be aware of when you're using a, a, a variable ND. Um, the other thing you need to be aware of when using a variable ND is um, that every variable nutrient density filter, regardless of type, regardless of brand, regardless of what the marketing fluff tells you, every variable ND filter on the market is susceptible to what's called cross polarization. And if you've ever used a variable ND, you know that that's when this lovely dark X starts to cross over your screen um, or over your image. It's uh, most common when you're using a wide angle lens and it starts to happen when you're at the high end of the, um, of the amount of filtration. Some brands have made the claim that their filters don't produce a cross X pattern. And in some cases that could technically be correct, but the way that they are doing that um, is they are preventing the filter from going its full length or, or rather it's, it's full workable distance of stop ranges. So if a filter would normally go from one stop to eight stop of light reduction, they're stopping it at five because they figured out in, in their labs that the filter starts to cross um, a polarized with most lenses when you get past five stops. That's all well and good, but any photographer knows that there's a lot of working distance between that, um, that, that, that cross polarization zone, particularly if you're using a telephoto lens or a zoom lens, because you're not, a, that, that cross polarization isn't as noticeable then. So keep that in mind. Now, um, let's dive in a little bit to what makes ProMasters HGX Prime uh, variable ND filter uh, special. Well, for starters, and we're using a 77 millimeter as our price point here, you'll see that when you compare it to some of the other competitors out there, ours is better priced. Um, it uh, removes between 1.3 and 8 stops of range, and we actually have uh, visually demarcated lines on the filter um, that show you uh, where each of those stops are from minimum to maximum, so you can get consistent, repeatable results. We use an ultra-hardened um, individually polished and ground uh, glass with 36 layers of anti-reflective coatings on it. It has our Repelimax 2 coating on it, which makes it uh, scratch resistant, static resistant, water, dust, dirt, oil, fingerprint uh, resistant. And then we have mechanical hard stops too. So that means you can't accidentally take this lens or this filter outside of its workable range. Um, we are uh, the only 
filter brand that I am aware of that has an X mark on the filter. So that tells you when you're going to start to enter that danger zone where that X uh, pattern or that cross polarization as the technical name is can start to occur. We actually mark that right on the filter so you can see when that um, will start to occur and you can trim it back if you want to. Uh, they're made in Japan. Uh, they're backed by our one year unconditional warranty and they're available in common sizes from 49 to 82 millimeters. Uh, so that's a look at our HGX prime variable indies. Now let's use some, uh, let's take a look at some examples of why and how you would use a neutral density filter. So here's an image that I admittedly did not take. I took it off the internet. Um, you know, so all credit to the photographer whose name I couldn't find. Um, but this is one of only two images in the entire thing that uh, I, I didn't take. Um, here is water coming in on these rocks and splashing in. As a photographer, I want to remind you that you were the artist. You were in control of what the end result of that image looks like and what kind of mood and emotion you're trying to convey. So as a photographer in a scene like this one, you have two choices. You can choose to freeze every single one of those droplets of water in time, or you can choose to slow down time so all of those droplets blend together and you get to capture the essence of that movement. Um, and it just tells a different story. Neither is technically correct. I mean, they're both technically correct is what I should say, um, but neither is superior to the other. It's your choice as a photographer what kind of story do you want to tell? Well, in the example of this photo, they chose to freeze that moment in time. But as we see in the next photo, they chose to use a neutral density filter to slow down time, remove about 10 stops of light so they could get this smoky, glassy quality to the water that just tells a very different story and gives a different level of visual appeal to the image. So here is um, a, a waterfall in uh, central Ohio. I believe this is in uh, Lithopolis, Ohio. The name of the waterfall is escaping me at the moment, but I know it'll come to me the minute uh, we hang up on today's call. That's just the way it goes. So I um, the, had the unique privilege um, to actually be down um, in the gorge uh, uh, to photograph this uh, little waterfall. And as a photographer, I had again, two options as to how to photograph it. I could have um, frozen every single one of those droplets as it was coming off very high speed, or I could choose um, to freeze uh, that moment in time. Uh, and, uh, or, or excuse me, to actually get that, that the, the motion of that moment in time uh, captured on my sensor rather than freezing the moment in time. So I, I opted for the motion. I actually used two filters here. I used a circular polarizer first because I wanted to reap the benefits of that polarization. Um, so what that meant for me was um, I wanted to get my uh, greens in here, you know, nice and vivid. And um, I wanted to get a lot of contrast in the rock face of this waterfall. So I used a circular polarizer first, adjusted that, and then I used a drop in um, 10 stop neutral density filter so I could shoot uh, a 30 second exposure and get this hazy, smoky, glassy look to the waterfall. Now, this should go without saying, but when you're using a, uh, an ND filter to get an exposure that is that long, you wanna make sure that you're using a tripod because most people um, and uh, most people can only hand hold a photo uh, steady at about uh, you know, a 30th of a second. I've known some people, you know, my 12-year-old, my who's a, a pretty excellent budding photographer, um, can handhold a photo uh, clean at a 10th of a second without any shake. Um, if I've had any caffeine, uh, particularly if it's a strong espresso, you better bet that, uh, you know, my, my results diminish, so I need to be closer to 145th or 160th of a second. When you're taking um, long shots like this, though, that are multiple seconds long, you really need a tripod to make sure that you're not introducing any handshake into the photo. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, I always recommend that whenever you're taking a photo 
um, and you can afford to be stationary, you owe it to yourself to use a tripod for a couple of reasons. Number one, it'll make you um, more aware of your composition and the time in which you're taking uh, uh, to compose that photo. I find that I spend less time spraying and praying and more time um, and being precise with my compositions and uh, my metering when I'm using a, a tripod than when I'm just hand holding a camera. And two, I've always told my students the three quickest ways to improve the sharpness of your photos are the three legs on your tripod. So let's take a look at some more example photos of using an ND filter. So this is the same waterfall. We're now zoomed out. Uh, we have a picture of, of Rock Mill or, or of an image of Rock Mill uh, right here uh, within view. We've got the historic covered uh, bridge in view as well. I used a circular polarizer again because I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose any detail, um, particularly in the bright spots of my sky here and, the, and where the sun was hitting. Um, the, uh, the, the foliage that I have coming off of the, the, the cliff face here. And um, I then used a 10 stop ND filter to make sure that I got that nice smoky glassy look uh, to my water. And uh, I was very pleased with the results. So this is a waterfall in Columbus, Ohio, right off of one of the major roads. It's called Hayden Falls. It's uh, uh, a, a little, uh, um, little jewel of a metro park that uh, my wife and, and daughter and I happened to stumble upon one day when uh, we were still living in the greater Columbus area and it was right after a snowstorm and then the next day it heated up to like 40 degrees so the snow was melting off pretty good this was the most active that I had ever seen that waterfall again I have a choice as a photographer how do I want to uh, capture this moment in time do I want to freeze every one of those droplets or do I want to tell a different story by by capturing the movement of the water as it's racing down these rocks and into this river. Well, I opted to capture the, the, uh, the movement. So I used a, uh, I believe it was a six stop ND that I used for this shot. I took about a uh, 20 second exposure and this was the photo that I got. And again, I was on a tripod and I composed it to where I had the rock face in front just because it, it provides some perspective and it kind of leads you into the photo. And then you've got the rock faces on the side here uh, kind of framing up uh, that waterfall. Another tool that is in a photographer's bag is what's called a graduated neutral density filter. Graduated NDs are uh, very common for times when photographers and videographers have an imbalanced scene. Let's say they have a really bright sky and a dark foreground, or you're photographing a sunset, so you're the the top of your, uh, you know, the middle of your frame is really bright. The top of your frame is, you know, varying degrees of uh, brightness, but your foreground is pretty dark. Um, uh, you know, photographers and videographers will use those to bring the scene into balance because going back to our conversation about circular polarizers, a uh, variable, or excuse me, a, um, a camera sensor will never be able to see at this point in time anyway, light and color the way that your human eyes can. So um, your eyes have a very impressive dynamic range and can very quickly shift from dark to light. That's why you can see uh, shadow and bright spots in a photo um, with uh, or, or within a composition uh, way better than you can within a photo because your, your eyes dynamic range, that's the ability to see uh, bright to dark without losing uh, information at one side or the other is a lot wider than a camera's dynamic range. Now they've gotten a lot better and some of the example photos I'm gonna show you, I was shooting with a, a camera that only had a four or five, five and a half stop dynamic range before I would start to clip data that is lose information either in the brights where it'd just be washed out white or in the darks where it would be blacked out. Um, they've gotten better, but it's still limited. So we use a gradual, ND, either a screw in or a drop in to bring these things in balance. Now, there are three types or four types of graduated neutral density filters. Um, there's what's called a soft, medium, or hard. Those are ones that are darkest at the top. And then when you get to the middle, they transition either very softly 
medium or dead horizon um, from dark to the clear side of the filter. And then we have what's called a reverse grad where it's at its darkest point in the center of the frame. We uh, typically use those when we're photographing a sunset along the horizon. It gets a little bit lighter as you move up to the top of the frame and then the bottom of the frame is, uh, is clear. So those are the different types of grad indies that we have. So we're back at Rock Mill and I had an interesting problem as a photographer here. I wanted to get everything uh, clearly in, um, in focus and in visibility from a dynamic range standpoint from the bright spots in my sky to the dark points down here um, in, my, um, in my foreground where the, the mill wheel is. But the challenge that I had was I had a little over a, uh, a five and a half stop uh, uh, dif difference um, between my brightest and darkest points. So I was losing a bunch of, of information in my sky. It was all getting washed out. And as you can see, I was starting to lose some detail down here as well. So what I did was I first used a circular polarizer um, because I wanted to get that polarization. I wanted to make my blue sky punchier. I wanted to get some contrast between the um, uh, the, the clouds and the blue of the sky, and I wanted the green of all the trees and foliage and stuff to really pop. Uh, and then I used what's called a two and a half stop, so that's the amount of light that it's filtering from top to middle, graduated neutral density filter with a soft transition. I didn't want it to be a real hard transition because there wasn't a clear horizon line here for me, but I did kind of use um, this midpoint uh, right below uh, where this, uh, this ledge is um, as, as kind of my de facto horizon point. So the dark side of the filter was covering the building. The clear side was covering um, the uh, um, mill of the, uh, or the wheel of the mill here. I metered off the building because that was a nice midpoint between um, the sky, which was very bright, and my foreground that was very dark. And this was my resulting image. So now, I've, because of the polarizer, saturation back in my tree. Um, wheel is going to be in three different positions. We don't want that because that ghosting doesn't look natural. So a ND filter is really handy in this case because I'm capturing one moment in time and I'm blending this exposure and bringing it all into balance. So with my uh, wheel, um, with my uh, mill uh, or from the, uh, the wheel mill here in motion, I then take the photo with a a two and a half stop ND filter, and now I've got balance. It's, it's becoming a lot cloudier, so I've got some contrast in the clouds. I've got my saturation in the trees, uh, thanks to um, the uh, circular polarizer, but I've balanced from the bright point to the darkest point, and most of all, I've been able to freeze that motion of the wheel in time, rather than getting stuck with ghosting like I would with HDR. This is our final example, and then we're gonna close and open up for your questions. So here's another perfect example of a time where I've got a lot of bright stuff, I've got some mid-tones, and then I've got this, this dark foreground. This is an instance where I actually used a two-stop hard ND because I've got a clear horizon line here that I wanna work with. So I first used my polarizer to get all the color saturation that you're gonna see down here in a minute. And then I used that two-stop ND to balance out my bright points to my dark points setting the horizon line right along uh, the tree. So where that transition point is on the filter, I set it right along with the trees. And now I've got a balanced photo where I've got my trees with uh, the, the changing leaves and the foreground. And then I've got a beautiful uh, uh, sky here with rays of light coming through. And I've got the various tones of gray and, um, and uh, uh, blue and white that you see there in the clouds. 
So every single one of these filters that we talked about today is on display at Dan's camera. Uh, you're welcome to go in there and check them out and try them out and speak to their educated sales consultants to uh, learn a great deal more. You can connect with ProMaster by visiting our website, promaster.com. You can uh, check us out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash ProMaster Photo. We're on Instagram at, at ProMaster Photo. I'm on Instagram as at Mictographer. There you can see uh, the photos that I capture in my day-to-day uh, -day life. Um, I encourage you to visit Dan's Camera though, either at their location in Allentown, PA, or at danscamera.com for all of your photographic needs. Um, they are wonderful, wonderful people and dear friends of mine who will take excellent care of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, everybody who attends gets a free 8x10 print by using this coupon code that you see on your screen, filter8x10. That's valid now through 1231 at danscamera.com. Scott, thanks for having me. I'm going to kick it back to you, my friend, and uh, we can open up things to questions. Awesome. Thanks so much. A ton of great information in there. I really like being able to see all the samples to get an idea of exactly what we're looking at there. We just have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, I have one question here that asks, uh, when you're using the circular polarizer, you talk about how you've got the, the protective or the UV filter on there 100% of the time. Do you leave that on then when you throw the circular polarizer on as well? That's a great question. I do. So yeah, that UV filter actually has threading on the front of it. So you can mount that circular polarizer right over top of it, get the, uh, the benefits from both filters, and then you can adjust that front ring of your circular polarizer uh, to get the level of polarization that you need. Cool. All right. And you don't have to worry about any sort of image degradation by stacking up multiple filters in front of the lens like that? There will come a point that if you stack, you know, an egregious amount of filters, there could be some, <laughs> uh, some image degradation issues. But if you're using a good high quality filter that is made of, you know, high quality glass and has good quality anti-reflective coatings, you can stack several of them without any issues. So in some of the ND examples that I was using, I had my UV filter on, I had a circular polarizer on, I had my filter holder for, for my drop-in filter, and most, uh, most filter holders can fit up to three filters at the same time. Right. So yeah. there's potentially five filters that I could have stacked, and I'm not really concerned about image quality. Nice, all right. Uh, let's see, Leroy asks, I have an Olympus Micro Four Thirds camera. Does ProMaster have filters that fit these tiny lenses? We do. I'm a Micro Four Thirds shooter myself. Um, I, I uh, switched to Olympus a little over three years ago. After years of being a Canon photographer, I was in one of my retailers and they put an EM1 Mark II in my hands and I fell in love. Um, so we carry, uh, uh, for all of our filters, uh, or particularly our main ones. So let's, let's talk UV and circular polarizer first. I carry just about every size in the sun from 40.5 up to, up to 105. So we're covered there. On our variable neutral density filters, we carry the most common sizes, but you can get a step down ring if you've got a really tiny lens. Um, okay. And then for our drop-in system, we actually don't make a drop-in holder. Um, I use a magnetic one from a company called H&Y that we, we also uh, distribute their filter holder. Um, that's compatible with my filters and it comes with the rings for a 72, 77, um, 82, and, and 95, I believe. Um, I was just using it the other day with uh, one of my Olympus lenses that has a 62 millimeter threading. So I just used a stepping ring from 72 to 62 and it worked like a charm. Cool. So whatever size lens you got, we got something to make it work. Oh yeah, the, the, the folks at Dan's camera can help you figure it out. <laughs> Let's see. If you'd used a soft graduated ND filter for that sunset, what would the image look like? So going back to this image here, I think is the one you were uh, referring to. If I used a soft grad, it still would have done the trick for me. I liked using a hard grad though, because it was very easy for me to tell um, right in my viewfinder where the dark um, portion of the filter ended and where the clear portion of the filter began so I could line it up almost perfectly with that horizon line. So that was the benefit of, of using the hard filter instead of the soft filter. Nine times out of 10, I reach for the soft and I tell people that, you know, unless you 
are always photographing horizons, that's probably the one for you to start with. I happen to own both now, but mm -hmm. it's, usually, it's, it's usually the soft transition ones that I, I find myself gravitating towards the most. Let's see. Nancy asks, what filter you, do you recommend for sunsets at a Florida beach? Uh, that's a great question. I would recommend um, you're definitely going to want a polarizer. You're probably going to want a UV. Um, and uh, if you want to balance the, the sky out with your foreground rather than the foreground being dark, you would use what's called a reverse grad ND. Whereas, you know, let's, let's pretend for a moment that, that my tablet is, is the filter. The darkest part would actually be in the middle. It would get a little bit lighter as you go up um, towards the top of the frame. And then the bottom half of the frame is actually uh, empty. That's a reverse graduated neutral density filter. All right, so we talked about a bunch of different filters. If you're only gonna put two in your bag, what are your two favorite ND filters? Oh man, great question. So if I had to choose two, um, I would probably do a 10 stop fixed ND and a two stop soft ND. So two stop and red. And, and it's, yeah, and incidentally, uh, those are our, uh, our two best sellers as well. So the masses appear to agree with my insanity. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Andrea asked, do your filters fit all lenses? I think that's kind of along the lines of the, uh, the tiny Olympus lenses that we talked about, right? Yep, so yeah, we, we make filters for virtually every size. And if, if there's a particular filter we make that isn't in a size you need, uh, the folks at Dance Camera City can set you up with a stepping ring that would allow you to adapt down to that size without seeing any vignetting or shadowing. Let's see, Nancy asks, is there a kit that contains all the drop-in ND filters? Uh, we do not make a kit. I'm sure the folks at Dan's camera could help you come up with a custom kit. Um, you know, what I usually recommend folks do is if, if you're, if you're interested in starting with fixed indies, start with either a 10 stop or a six stop, master that, and then figure out if you need another density. Most people find that they end up not. If you want the convenience of multiple densities without having to, um, uh, without having to uh, deal with the, the high purchase price of multiple filters, that's where a variable ND is a, a benefit to you because it's one filter that can fit in your camera bag and can cover a wide range. Uh, now there are those trade-offs we discussed, but we've done our best to mitigate those by providing you the best quality glass and coatings and showing you where that, where that X pattern is most likely uh, to start. But uh, the reason that variable ND filters are so freaking popular is because of their versatility. The reason that people use fixed NDs is because they want maximum sharpness, maximum color neutrality, and they want the best of the best. And uh, for that, you have to have a variety of them. But I would recommend starting with a six or a 10. Yeah. That variable ND, though, I picked that one up specifically for some of the video work that I do and the ability to say, okay, this is my aperture, this is my shutter speed, and then just dial in with the variable to get, okay, now I got the exposure I want. The convenience was kind of worth the trade-off for me for that stuff. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's a spectacular feature of it. Let's see, Michael asks, I have multiple size lenses. It is not financially feasible to purchase the HGX prime filter for all the different lenses. Am I better off purchasing the prime filter for the largest size and using adapter rings? Uh, or, Let's see, or in smaller lenses or buying separate mid-level or base level, fil level filters individually sized to each lens. Well, I know my answer to this one, but I'd like to hear what, you, uh, what your take is on this one. Beautiful question. Um, I, uh, I, I always say that when you can afford to buy one for each, that's the way to go just because then you're not having to mess around with adapter rings, particularly when you're in a hurry. But um, if... Uh, if, if you need to divide your budget between multiple hobbies, like, you know, like <laughs> I do, uh, um, then uh, sometimes, you know, choosing one option that can cover the multitude is the way to go. So I, I would say if your largest lens is a 77 millimeter, like mine is, you buy the 77 and then you get the adapter rings. Um, the only point where you have a diminishing return on that is if you're in the case of some of our micro four thirds shooters that are on the call, like me, where <laughs> I've got, 
you know, my, my big Olympus zoom lens is a 77 millimeter, but my 30 millimeter macro that I adore and I use all the time is what, 46 millimeters, I think. So <laughs> I can't, I can't easily adapt for that. So I have a UV right. filter that I leave on it. I, I always recommend that you, you buy a UV filter for, or, or protection filter for every lens you have, period. Don't, don't do the switching back and forth game there. Oh, yeah. But for your polarizers or your NDs, adapt whenever it's possible. And then when it's not possible, uh, find a way to make it in the budget because you'll, you'll get the benefits out of it in the long run. Yeah. Let's see. That sunset picture had a lot of clouds. What about shooting cloudless sunsets? Uh, a cloudless sunset, I would probably say that a, a reverse grad would have been the Back way to go. Uh, m much like our previous example of how, how would you shoot a sunset on, on a beach in Florida. So if I had a lot of clouds here, I don't have as much detail that I have to worry about uh, uh, trying to uh, gather. So instead of using a, a hard ND where it is effectively the, the same amount of, uh, of uh, light filtration from here to here, I would use a reverse ND where I'm at my darkest point here, it's getting lighter as I go this way, and then I'm perfectly clear on this side. All right, another sunset picture. How many stops are we looking at? How many stops do you like for sunset? It, it's gonna vary depending on the time of day, the, uh, the, the you know, what's in your foreground, uh, what's in the sky. Um, so I can't give you a hard and fast answer for that. Mm -hmm. My general rule with a, um, uh, with any kind of shots where I'm doing um, a, uh, where I'm using a, a graduated ND filter is, and, and this might be, this previous image here might be a better example for this, uh, but I try to find um, by using either a, a separate spot mirror, like a Sekonic 858, which I keep in my bag, um, or a, um, or your camera's built in, you know, a center weighted or spot meter to figure out what the difference is between your brightest point okay, yeah. and your darkest point. And if you can't do that math in your head, I was a theology major, English minor, so the math isn't so good. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you can't do that math in your head and you know that, you know, when you measure the sky, it's showing you F16 and you, um, measure the foreground and it's showing you um, f28 well then set your camera manual go go to f uh, you know 16 and then just you know every three clicks is a stop so just count them one two three one one two three two one two three four until you get down to what your meter reading was for that darkest point and now you know what your difference is from brightest to darkest and you can very easily choose your your best ND for the job then to figure out how to balance it out. Right. So in that case, what I would do, it, I, I would actually then go back and say, all right, well, what's the difference between my my brightest point um, and my my midpoint? And in this case, you know, it was I don't know a couple stops. So that's uh, that's where I decided to use the two and a half stop um, uh, grad ND, and that did the job well for me. Perfect. All right. Uh, and then Leroy asks: uh, Most cameras can come with set settings for sunset photos, scenery, nighttime. Don't these settings compensate for what a filter is meant to do? That's a great question. And the truth of the matter is, is that they try but your camera's dynamic range is still limited. So what those uh, internal settings are really doing is telling your camera, based on what the internal computer is saying, this is what your shutter sh uh, speed should be, this is what your aperture should be, this is what your ISO uh, should be. But that's your exposure. What your exposure doesn't dictate is how much light your camera can see without losing detail either on the bright side or the dark side. So that's where a filter comes into play, is it's helping you bring that stuff back into balance instead of knowing that I'm gonna lose detail on one end or the other. Or being able to do, you know, a 10 second exposure of a waterfall under broad daylight. Bingo. Right. Like, I can only close down my aperture so far before I got to find some other way to cut down the amount of light coming in. Right. 
Let's see, we've got a question on the drop-in style filters. Can you do use different size lenses and you can you mix and match like ND and then graduated? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the ND holders, you know, let's let's go back to my my picture of an ND holder that I have in here. This this is a, a one from a brand that no longer exists uh, that uh, I used to own. Um, so uh, this has three slots that can hold, um, you know, multiple uh, filters at the same time. Um, it came natively with rings for both 82 and 77 millimeter. But again, I can either get other mounting rings or I can get stepping rings to adapt it down for my different lens sizes. And then a lot of ND holders uh, like this one, uh, you can't see it, but behind this filter, there's actually a, um, a space for a circular polarizer. So I can use a circular polarizer and adjust it from a wheel that's on the back of the holder. That's pretty common with most holder systems now. And then yes, I can stack multiple filters of different types. So if I wanted um, to do both a, um, a photo where I need, I want to slow down time and capture that movement, but I'm also trying to balance the exposure from, uh, from bright um, to dark, then I could, yes, absolutely use both a fixed ND as well as a graduated ND. All right, let's see. And then Kevin asks, on circular polarizer lenses, what's the difference between HGX Prime and Digital HD? Good question. The main difference is going to be uh, the type of glass. We use a, a special proprietary glass for our HGX Prime circular polarizers. Remember how I said at the beginning that our other collections will always use the same types of glass. When you get to the level of craftsmanship that an HGX Prime filter offers, we use the right glass for the tool. So our UV filters use a glass from Corning's optical division that filters at 410 nanometers. Our circular polarizers from HGX Prime use a special type of glass that is a, um, where the polarization is built, uh, is baked into the glass rather than a coating. And um, we, uh, it also offers high light transmission. So most, um, most uh, circular polarizers, you use you lose two stops of light. This one, you only lose about one and one third of a stop of light, so you get a little more light in there. Um, and it's going to have 22 layers of multi coatings plus that Repelamax, so that makes it resistant to fingerprints and smudges. If you get water on it, it's going to bead right off. It's going to be mm -hmm. very easy to clean. The Digital HD, which is a very good filter, it uses Shot B270 optical glass, which is excellent. It has 12 layers of anti-reflective coatings, which is very good, uh, but it doesn't have that repellent max. So that's, that's the main difference. You, you, you don't get as specialized of a, of a type of glass, you don't get the same number of coatings, and you don't get that repellent max. That's proprietary to HGX Prime. And that repellent max is pretty impressive. I was out taking pictures after we had that flooding this summer. I was out taking pictures. There were still storm clouds and this dramatic sky, and the, the filter on there to get that the polarized light and bring out the contrast in the clouds. And a car drove by, splashed through a puddle, and I got soaked. Now, my camera's weather sealed, but I got muddy water all over the front of the lens, and I went to go wipe it off, and it was clean. Just everything just yep. ran off. There was nothing there. Yeah, I, uh, nothing quite as dramatic, but my uh, two-year-old has reached for my camera lens with sticky fingers before because, <laughs> you know, he's a toddler, and uh, he lives from snack to snack, you know. Sure. <laughs> you know, most of us live from paycheck to paycheck. He lives from snack to snack. Uh, and uh, uh, he reached for my camera with sticky fingers once. I had a UV uh, HGX Prime filter on it and uh, literally a little bit of hot air, which I'm a professional salesman, so I've got plenty of that. Um, and then a, a biker fiber cloth, and I was able to clean that, that sticky gunk right off. Had that been a digital HD filter or one of my standard filters, I would have had to have broken out the lens cleaning solution and a significant yep. amount of elbow grease, and I might have still not gotten it off. All right, and Andrea asks, what's the brand of tripod that you use? Uh, I use a ProMaster tripod. So uh, ProMaster makes every uh, possible accessory that you could think of. Um, uh, whenever I meet somebody on an airline, uh, hey, remember when we can go on flights? Uh, I'm invariably asked, hey, what do you do for a living? And my answer is always, I work for a company that makes everything from $10 replacement lens caps to $1,800 lighting kits. Um, so the, uh, the the tripod that I use, I'll try and uh, 
uh, get you a, a quick image of it here. Um, it is uh, the, the ProMaster XCM525. Yep, um, nice. It's available It's available in both um, aluminum and carbon fiber. Um, the version that I uh, use is actually carbon fiber, but that, uh, that's just a, uh, uh, happens to be a, a matter of uh, personal preference. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm using and I love. And, and the nice thing about it is, is, uh, it, it gives me a lot of, um, customization that I don't have with a regular old tripod. Like I can, uh, add a tilt column for when I'm doing macro work. I can add, um, all weather feet for when I'm shooting in sand or snow. I can add, um, uh, leg warmers when I'm shooting in, in freezing temperatures. So those are those are things that I wouldn't have from a, a, a regular tripod. There's a, a lot of modularity to it. Yeah, and I do a bunch of you know hiking and like going out to get those waterfalls. That XCM is so light when you strap it on your backpack. It's a real it's a real back saver after you've been yeah. on the trail for more than a couple miles. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we've got for questions. Uh, thanks again so much for joining us today. This has been, uh, uh, yep, Mara says, this class was fantastic. Thanks for all this fabulous information. And I have to agree, we got a ton of great technical and other ways, like just a bunch of great information today. So thanks so much for joining us for the uh, 43rd anniversary. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me, Scott. Thank you to all of the participants. Uh, both uh, here on Zoom and on Facebook for uh, coming and hanging out with us. And uh, the greatest thanks you can give me is to continue to support your local camera store, Dan's Camera City. So thank you very much, everyone.